in court cases. 42 documents clearly showed that our security services were aware of the torture of Binyam Muhammad. The government has spent 30 million pounds with 70 barristers defending this case to try and stop the, the truth coming out. It shouldn't be just left to individuals like Andy, Omar, um, Mwazim Beg, Binyam and others to be left to fight with a handful of resources against this. It's up to ordinary people and I think people in this room should go away heartened that we actually do have Omar here speaking today and there's others that we still have to fight for and they may well not be British citizens. There'll be the case of Dr. Arafa Siddiqui and other people, Pakistanis, people not from rich countries, people not from European countries who have forgotten, the thousands who have disappeared. We have to expose that and we have to fight for that legacy. There, there isn't much to add that what, that what Anwar has said and Andy, what, what only one thing I wanted to say is that uh, your uh, campaigning and your work and your support does make a difference. In my case, the government has turned a blind eye. They were, uh, they were uh, possible for them. It was good for them to, to send the intelligence service to interrogate us in, inside Guantanamo Bay, but the government didn't want to do anything. They pretended they didn't know that I, that I existed inside Guantanamo Bay. But it was convenient for them to send the intelligence service to go to Guantanamo Bay and interrogate us and, uh, and be part and, and be part and witnesses to the torture that went on. But when uh, the people, my family, uh, we met the lawyers who started the case at the time, Clive Smith, in 2003, and he said to them, if you continue your silence because of the fear of the Islamic phobia, the fear of people's accusation, the fear of coming out in, in public, they didn't know how the people would react to them, uh, saying that their son was in Guantanamo Bay. So Clive said to them, you know, the only way forward is to campaign, is, is, to, is to come in public and speak about the case because the government can care the less, will not do anything unless they are pressurized and embarrassed to do the right thing. And this is what happened. They started to speak on television about my case. Uh, people in Brighton, uh, lots of people in Brighton uh, took to campaigning and, and made it a matter of importance in Brighton. It became a big issue in Brighton and they campaigned, they lobbied MPs, councillors in Brighton started to vote on it and it took on the local newspapers and it continued until the government after a couple of years, 2007, were, uh, were um, embarrassed into asking for my release from Guantanamo Bay and, uh, and as, as you see I have been released successfully and I'm here standing speaking to you and it's all to, due to your work and work to many many people in Brighton and, and other cities who've campaigned and worked hard to make our cases in the public knowledge. So your, your, your efforts and your support and your work does make a big difference. This is something that I wanted to tell you. Now it's not like a Glasgow audience to be quite so quiet, so we're ready to hear from our first speaker from the floor, but I'm hoping to get away from uh, quite a number of you um, before she finishes, so that I've at least got a cue. Thank you. I'll do is, like I said before, I'll collect a couple of questions or, or contributions and then we can go back to the panel to get the response and we'll get um, their answer for that. So, gentlemen here and then we'll do the front.
you hear me? Yeah. Um, my main point, really, our question is to Omar. Um, can I ask, have you been given any anything in terms of support uh, just to sort of reintegrate back into society to cope with the post-traumatic stress you must have endured? Um, and I would just like to... A heartfelt, I, I'm so terribly sorry this has happened to you. And um, I really think we all should try and work harder to, of course, release the prisoners, but to, to prevent this happening in the future, it's absolutely horrific. And, and I'm just terribly sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, the, the, the use of religious uh, insults and how they use religion into torture in itself in Guantanamo Bay was widely spread. Part of the policy inside Guantanamo is to use, to use religion, to humiliate people and to incense them and, and to agitate them. So they, they, the, the religion was something important for them. We were all, everyone in Guantanamo Bay was Muslim and he was of that background. We, we went to Guantanamo, many of us in Guantanamo Bay went to Afghanistan and Pakistan and these areas to, to do lots of uh, aid and help and, and create schools and uh, dig wells and so on. And there were many Americans doing the same thing. And there were many other European countries or citizens from other countries doing the same thing. But none of them have ended up in Guantanamo. So it was the religion, it was important. The, discrimi the discrimination was based on, on, on our background. The use of religion abuse was, was so much widely uh, used inside Guantanamo. They used to take copies of the Quran, for example, and throw them to the floor, throw them to the toilet to incense and anger us and use that as a form of breaking people down, I think. It's a stupid policy, but it's something that went on. As for the other question, thank you very much for your uh, kindness and concerns. And uh, yes, I had the, when I came out from Guantanamo, I had the support of uh, friends in, Guantanamo, in, uh, in Brighton, and uh, family, and the support of people like that. But uh, if you're asking about whether I was compensated or apologized to, that didn't happen. That, that doesn't happen to people who are released from Guantanamo. They are released to build up the lost years that uh, they have to, uh, they, they've endured, the seven or eight years, some of them now nine years. Some of them are young youngsters who needed to con continue their university studies. Some of them needed to rebuild their lives. Some of them needed uh, to, to do lots of operations and um, lots of operations for the things that they endured inside prison, the damage they were caused, kidney failures, people with heart problems because of the treatment inside Guantanamo. In, in terms of why um, Guantanamo is not closed, I think that's deliberate. Uh, Barack Obama might well have said a year ago it was a good soundbite. He had a lot of good soundbites to say, I'm going to shut down Guantanamo. But the fact is, they want to propagate the idea that these men that remain in Guantanamo and women um, are still dangerous people i.e. America didn't get it wrong, but they don't quite know what to do with them. So it's, it's to keep that idea and propaganda going. I mean, the fact that people don't, don't actually realize is that, for instance, when Omar, Binyam, um, and Muazzam came back into this country, they were still subjected to all sorts of orders, you know, travel restrictions, movement, control orders, things like that, um, as though they were somehow, they were terrorists. The fact is that the United States of America had no evidence, couldn't prosecute them, had nothing on them, they were innocent people, yet they still somehow are saying, well, we can't actually shut down Guantanamo because we need to send these people on to their own countries that are extremely dangerous. Uh, and with regards to the idea that somehow, you know, these detainees are declared innocent and in terms of litigation, there is a, almost a form of a hate campaign that goes on in this country, I think, against the likes of Omar and um, Wazim and the other detainees that have been released, that somehow that it's continually perpetuated by members of the mainstream press, by politicians, that these are dangerous men, and you know we have to protect national security. What national security do we have to protect by exposing that members of the British security services were present when people who were from this country or from other 